Good evening and thank you for joining us. The court today handed down the sentences in the high-profile trial involving the Dragon Slaying Brigade. The mastermind of the bomb plotting group was given the highest prison term among the defendants, 23 years and 10 months behind bars. A prison van carried the seven defendants to the high court in the morning. Six of them had pleaded guilty earlier. This Dragon Slaying Brigade marks the first case to be prosecuted under the anti-terrorism law. Judge Judiana Barnes described this case as more serious than the crimes committed by one of Hong Kong's most infamous armed robber, Ip Kai Fun, as it aimed to kill police officers, create panic across city, and subvert the government. The bomb squad's mastermind, Ng Chi Hong, was said to have recruited followers in order to meet political goals and subvert the Hong Kong government. He was said to have deliberately added metal nails to the bomb to ratchet up the destructiveness. The judge said that's vicious and shocking. Ng pleaded guilty to having conspired to commit the bombing of prescribed objects and possession of firearms and ammunition with intent to endanger life under the anti-terrorism law. He was sentenced to 23 years and 10 months behind bars. On Brigade leader Wang Chung Kung, the judge said even if the bomb plot failed, the degree of viciousness was indescribable, and the plan Hatch had disregarded other people's lives. Considering he was not the mastermind and had not handled the firearms among other factors, Wang was sentenced to 13 years and 6 months in prison. David Su, who acted as a gunman in the plot, was the prosecution witness. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison for three charges, including conspiracy to murder a police officer. Pan Kwan Ho was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment for his roles as a watchman and a deliverman of bombs. Lai Chung Pong was sentenced to 10 years and 10 months imprisonment for having help with the bomb making. Chen Yuk Lung, who was in possession of firearms, was sentenced to nine years behind bars. Choi Hoi Mei was jailed for five years and 10 months over the charge of designing the detonating device. Six other defendants were acquitted. Another female defendant, Chong Su Ying, pleaded guilty to possession of a firearm without the license and was earlier sentenced to seven years and four months in prison. According to testimonies provided during the trial, bomb squad members attempted to kill police officers during the protests on December 8, 2019. That's by vandalizing a bank and detonating a small bomb to lure the officers there before setting off the bigger bombs. They also planned to station a gunman nearby to shoot the officers. On December 9th, police seized a cache of explosives intended for the bomb plot at Wyan College. The seized explosives were later confirmed to be able to cause huge damage. The suspected gunman David Su was arrested the same month in Taipo. Police found weapons in his hiding place. Okay. Okay. Taraji has marked not just the latest typhoon ever recorded in a year, it has also ushered in the city's first typhoon trading day. Among the districts that have been the hardest hit by typhoons over the years is right here in the windswept neighborhood of Hengpachun in the Eastern District. But not a lot of big waves this time under Taraji. Some residents said winds were not as strong as before. Flood prone hotspot Lei Yu Moon also saw fewer precautionary measures against storm surges. At Hong Hong Pier, some even took a dip in the sea. The government received 13 reports of fallen trees amid the storm. And after the TA typhoon alert was replaced with a strong wind signal number 3 at 10.20 a.m., bus stops were swamped with people rushing back to work. Similar sight at Shenzhen in Xunwan. More crowds, too, around MTR stations. At the airport, around 10 flights were cancelled amid the T8 alert. The airport authority said most operations were not disrupted. Some airport staff also handed out bottled water and snacks to travelers. Tropical storm Taraji also ushered in the city's very first typhoon trading day. It's business as usual for this brokerage firm in central amid the number 8 gale or storm signal. Marking the first activation of the severe weather trading operational arrangements that the Hong Kong exchanges and clearing launch in September, the city's securities and derivatives markets are allowed to continue services despite severe weather conditions. This staff member said even before the measures roll out, they used to work amid T8 with the international markets running on. Others, trade settlement requests and inquiries could be heard streaming in as the market opened at 9.30 a.m. This securities firm in Wan Chai meanwhile suspended services under T8. The Hong Kong exchanges and clearing said after tests and trials, more than 99 percent of securities market participants were able to maintain operations under such inclement weather, with only four firms lacking in readiness. Some brokerage firms opened after the T8 alert was downgraded to T3.
Its manager said all the glass windows and doors in buildings around Central can pose safety concerns amid the typhoon, so they don't want their workers to take a risk during their commute to the office. Under the new typhoon trading arrangements, Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury Christopher Hui said the city's stock market saw a half-day turnover reaching nearly $81.5 billion. He said it marked a new milestone for Hong Kong's financial markets, aligning further with international standards while enhancing the city's competitiveness. The number 8 gale or storm signal had been enforced overnight for over 11 hours before it was replaced by the strong wind signal number 3 at 10.20 a.m. Tropical Storm Taraji is now centered about 140 kilometers south-southwest of Hong Kong. It is expected to swirl slowly westwards across the seas south of the city. The observatory said the number three tropical cyclone warning signal is expected to remain in effect mostly tonight until the threat to Hong Kong is further reduced. U.S. Special Counsel Jack Smith plans to step down along with other members of his team before President-elect Donald Trump takes office. Smith brought two legal cases against Trump, one involving classified documents Trump kept after leaving office and the other involving Trump's efforts to overturn his 2020 election loss. A Florida-based federal judge dismissed the document's case in July. The Justice Department is now evaluating how to wind down the election-related case. Trump has denied charges in both cases and said he will fire Smith within two seconds once he assumes office. It has been a long-standing Justice Department policy, too, that says a sitting president cannot be prosecuted. Israeli military strikes killed at least 22 Palestinians across the Gaza Strip on Wednesday as they deepened their incursion into the northern town of Beit Hanun. Israeli airstrikes also pounded Beirut's Hezbollah-controlled southern suburbs for a second consecutive day. This as Lebanon waited to hear Washington's latest ceasefire proposals after a U.S. official expressed hope a truce could be reached. Tracy Furness reports. Loud explosions heard before daybreak Thursday across Beirut. A huge column of black smoke rising into the night sky as orange flames lit up nearby buildings. The strike comes a day after the Israeli military struck several sites in Beirut's southern suburbs of Da'iya. The military said it was targeting Hezbollah facilities and interests. Explosions seen too in Gaza Thursday morning. Israeli forces have encircled and largely isolated the Gaza Strip's northernmost areas for the past month, saying Hamas militants have regrouped. An Israeli airstrike near a refugee camp in central Gaza killed at least five people and injured two others. A 15-year-old boy was among the dead. His mother said she had just put her three children to sleep when she heard the explosion. A fire was burning their blankets, so she carried two of her children outside. When she came back for her son, he was dead. Meanwhile, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Dannon, said that the UNRWA Commissioner General Philippe Lazzarini should resign. Dannon accused the organization of engaging in terrorism. I confronted Commissioner Lazzarini on his responsibility for UNRWA's infiltration by Hamas, its fostering of terrorism, and its total failure of accountability. I demanded that Commissioner Lazzarini resigned if he had any decency. Lazzarini responding, saying Israel continues to use the allegations of breaching neutrality to strip the Palestinian from the refugee statute and to undermine and to bury once and for all the two-state solution. UNRWA is a casualty of this war. Let's do no mistake the intention to undermine the agency are politically motivated. They have nothing to do with uh, breaches of neutrality. Breaches of neutrality are being handled seriously by the agency. I acknowledge that we are not uh, operating in a zero-risk uh, environment, uh, but we are operating with a zero-tolerance environment. Tracy Furness, TVB News.
President Xi Jinping will soon arrive in Peru to attend this year's APEC summit. After that, he will pay a state visit to Peru from Thursday to Sunday. Some analysts said China ambitions grasping the opportunity to usher in closer cooperation with Latin America. Danny Zhou reports. Located in the center of South America's Pacific coast, Peru is deemed as a gateway to Latin American markets. China is Peru's largest trading partner. Their bilateral trade was close to 36 billion U.S. dollars last year. In 2013, the two nations elevated their ties to the level of comprehensive strategic partnership. And at this year's APEC summit, President Xi Jinping is set to sign an updated free trade pact and 30 other cooperation agreements with his Peruvian counterpart. The two leaders will jointly inaugurate the China-funded Chenkei port, which is one of Peru's key infrastructure mega-projects under the Belt and Road Initiative. In a signed article published on Peru's media outlet, she recounted the two countries' deep-rooted bond and said the project would lead China, Peru and Latin America to common development and prosperity. Some think tank pundits suggested Xi's visit to the Andean nation would bring countries of the global south together and increase China's influence in Latin America. The director of the Hong Kong Jiming Institute said China needs to take in masses of South American products like meat and metal, despite higher unit price and transportation fee. Because it is necessary for such a large economy to prepare for changes in the geopolitical landscape. Meanwhile, as U.S. President Joe Biden will also be present at the summit and hold talks with President Xi, a political commentator noted the meeting will only be ritual, which means China and the U.S. will be endeavoring to keep communication open and maintain bilateral relationship. He said it is impossible for an outgoing president to make commitments on behalf of the United States. And China will not put forward any expectations at the meeting considering the uncertainties that lie ahead. Danny Zhou, TVB News. In Brazil, a man killed himself with a bomb outside the country's Supreme Court after trying to enter the building on Wednesday. The blast comes five days before the G20 heads of state meet in Rio de Janeiro, followed by a state visit to the capital Brasilia by President Xi Jinping. The first of two explosions went off in a parking lot near the court building, and a second blast came seconds later in the front of the court where the man's body was found. Police have no, not identified the man, but hope it was a crime of a lone wolf. The Supreme Court justices had just ended a plenary session when the blast happened and were quickly evacuated to safety. Locally, the Independent Commission Against Corruption, better known as the ICAC, opened a new cafe at its headquarters in North Point. It will be open to the public starting tomorrow. Timothy Lee tells us more. Visitors entering the ICAC's North Point headquarters will spot a giant cup of coffee in the middle of its lobby starting today. The decoration is part of the anti-corruption body's efforts to promote its new cafe, named 1974 after the year of its establishment. The ICAC, whose act of offering coffee to suspects has been popularized in local culture over the years. This as it opened the cafe with the aim of allowing residents to try the famous drink without fear of being a suspect. Besides coffee, visitors can check out small booths in the lobby displaying memorabilia from ICAC cases over the past five decades. Yeah, oh. Among participants at its opening ceremony today were Secretary for Justice Paul Lam and Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury Christopher Huey. Kali Kwong, a delegate representing the city in the National People's Congress, also took part in a promotional video for Cafe 1974. To ensure the quality and diversity of its coffee, the cafe imported coffee beans from Yunnan province and a number of other countries, including Ethiopia and Vietnam. Open between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. on weekdays, the ICAC cafe is jointly run with Polo & Cook, with the latter providing vocational training for disabled individuals. Visitors can try an assortment of coffees at the Cafe 1974, which were given names in Chinese, such as integrity, confidentiality, and anti-corruption. The ICAC added that it may expand its list of coffee beans and its menu in the near future. Timothy Lee, TV News. And that's the news. Thank you for watching.